Hey everyone, we're back with part two of this little series in which I'm exposing all of the clowns at the Discovery Institute for the charlatans that they are. In part one, we demonstrated that Casey Luskin is a fraud and a liar beyond any shred of doubt. In part two, we will address Stephen Meyer, another pusher of intelligent design hiding behind a thin veneer of legitimacy. What's he all about? Meyer is one of the co-founders of the DI and currently serves as program director for its Center for Science and Culture. As a co-founder, he was intimately involved in the creation of the so-called Wedge document, an internal document that was leaked to the internet in 1999 and explicitly states their religious agenda, with words and pictures, as they chose to put Michelangelo's creation of Adam right on the cover. Subtle. That's right, the seriously all about science and totally not about religion institute is, surprise surprise, religiously motivated by their own secret words. This document is horse manure right from the first sentence, which is a lie about Western civilization being built upon humans being created in God's image, and then a list of things they want to give religion credit for, which quite honestly have only been possible once religion loosened its grip on humanity. There is the typical tripe about how without fear of a vengeful God we would all be savage murderers, stealing and raping 24-7, failing to mention all of the genocides that have been performed in the name of one god or another, and there's Meyer's name with a bullet at the end of page one. On the next page, there are only two governing goals listed for the DI. The first is to defeat scientific materialism, that idiotic buzzword we deconstructed in part one, and the other is to replace materialistic explanations with a theistic understanding. In other words, to replace science with God. The last of these 20-year goals is to see design theory penetrate our religious, cultural, moral, and political life. It can't be made any clearer than this, religion everywhere, including government. Anyone who is convinced that the DI does not have a religious and political agenda is a sucker. Their pathetic attempt at damage control as a result of this leak was to craft a response called the Wedge Document, so what? Like an insolent teenager who got caught pulling the fire alarm. This response basically consists of the DI acting shocked and appalled by people making claims that the document says things that it factually says. For example, right in the second paragraph, one group claimed that the document supplied evidence of a frightening 20-year master plan to have religion control not only science, but also everyday life, laws, and education. Oh my, wherever would anyone get that wild idea? I'll spare you the details of the 18 pages of desperate backpedaling, but it's linked below in a laugh riot, especially the parts where they pretend materialism is responsible for all the heinous acts that have historically been the exclusive domain of religion. Oh, sweet irony. Anyway, as we elucidated in part one, the immediate goal of Meyer and the rest of the DI is to get religion taught in schools. This was formally attempted in the Kitzmiller v. Dover debacle of 2005 in Pennsylvania. This was their first direct attempt to fulfill their agenda, and they failed miserably as the court ruled that intelligent design is religion, not science, and the mandate was deemed unconstitutional. While they won't formally admit that they want religion taught in science class, even though it's clear as day, they certainly won't admit to being motivated by a shift toward theocracy and a reunification of church and state. Their response to the wedge leak says they can't believe they have to say it, but they don't want that nasty, nasty theocracy. Honest. But this, too, is a hollow claim. We can see that by Meyer's own admission, most of their funding comes in the way of enormous donations from wealthy Christian fundamentalists who, in their own words, want to see the total integration of biblical law into our lives and who abide by the infallibility of the scripture. These are the types the DI answers to. Churchy McMoney bags. If the Christian equivalent of Sharia law is what they want to get for their money, you have to wonder why they're giving it to them, hmm? 
So with everyone up to speed on precisely what the DI really is, let's dig into Meyer and his pseudoscience. What's his background? With a bachelor's in physics and earth science, as well as a master's and PhD from Cambridge in philosophy of science, one might presume that he has a firm grasp on the scientific process. But alas, his allegiance is not to science, as is evidenced by his primary output, his books, the medium of choice for those who are allergic to peer review. Signature in the Cell attempts to argue that the structure of the cell points to intelligent design. Darwin's Doubt says the same regarding the Cambrian explosion. And most recently, Return of the God Hypothesis recycles old talking points and rounds out the trifecta of trash. With so much rubbish to address, I'll be focusing on just two of his most favorite arguments and demonstrating that they constitute a deliberate attempt to misrepresent science. I'll be staying away from arguments regarding the origin of life since I already covered that very neatly in my response to James Tour. Again, if any fans of the DI haven't seen that content, I implore you to finally check those out when you're ready, as they're quite thorough. But for now, let's move on to the fossil record, since it's something all of the DI folks seem to be having a little trouble with. Here's a snippet from Stephen Meyer Takes on Darwin's Tree. Because what we see in the fossil record, in particular, when we're looking at major innovations in biological form and structure is the abrupt appearance of such major innovations where in each case there those new f biological forms are lacking any discernible connection to similar forms in the lower sedimentary strata so you get an abrupt appearance of a new form of life usually persisting through the fossil record with some slight variation, but the basic form remaining static over long periods of time, and then either the form going extinct or persisting right up to the present. We don't see the gradual morphing of form from one major type of organism to another that is described by Darwin's Tree of Life and predicted on the basis of the action of his mechanism of natural selection and random variation slash mutation. Okay, so this quite nicely sets up the main strategy of folks like Meyer. Biologists say that evolution involves gradual change, so we should see the gradual change everywhere in the fossil record, and we totally don't at all, so evolution didn't happen. This is a blatant denial of what is contained in the fossil record, coupled with the hope that the viewer will not lift a finger to check and just take his word for it. There are countless examples of slow, gradual morphological change in the fossil record. From fish to tetrapods, from amphibians to reptiles to birds, from land mammals back to sea mammals like whales and dolphins, from early hominids to humans, as we discussed in part one, and countless others. One could fill up an entire semester of undergraduate study simply by discussing and categorizing these specimens. To pretend they don't exist is science denial, plain and simple. Of course, we do not have specimens for every single species that has ever existed because of how fossilization works. It's a relatively rare occurrence. Some short-lived species may have never been fossilized, and there are undoubtedly plenty of fossils that we have not yet found or may ever find. Two facts which Meyer himself summarizes with the term the artifact hypothesis without bothering to acknowledge the validity of these two limitations, choosing instead to lie about something called the Dushantu shale, which contains organisms we will discuss a bit later. But with the overarching lie well understood, let's dig into some of the more specific claims and compare them to the scientific literature to show how they are clearly false. When asked for examples of organisms showing up very suddenly in the fossil record, he said this. There are many examples of the abrupt appearance of new forms of animal and plant life in the fossil record. I wrote a book about one of the greatest of those events called the Cambrian Explosion, which is an event about 520 to 530 million years ago where the first animal forms arose abruptly in the fossil record with no discernible connection to similar forms in the lower Precambrian strata. It's really dramatic. 
So he may chalk this up to a misspeak, but he clearly said that the first animal forms appeared in the Cambrian explosion. This is objectively wrong, not just according to science, but even Meyer's own work. He points out in Chapter 4 of 2013's Darwin's Doubt that sponges and the mollusk-like Kimbarella are known from Ediacaran strata. He is well aware that animal life predates the Cambrian explosion. This event was a diversification of animal life, not its origin. Second, claiming that the Cambrian explosion lasted from 530 to 520 million years ago is wrong too, which he doesn't even clearly state as a range rather than an approximate singular date to deliberately maximize confusion. According to the 2011 paper, The Cambrian Conundrum, Early Divergence and Later Ecological Success in the Early History of Animals, we read as follows. The earliest skeletal fossils occur in the latest Ediacaran, but the first appearance of an array of plates, spines, shells, and other skeletal elements of bilaterian affinity begins during the early Cambrian Fortunian stage, 541 to around 530 MA, where MA stands for mega annum or millions of years ago. Reading further, Although many new groups have been described over the past decade, the pattern of diversification of both body fossils and trace fossils has remained largely robust. A recompilation of the first occurrence of all metazoan phyla, classes, and stem classes, extinct clades, of equivalent morphologic disparity shows their first occurrences in the latest Ediacaran by 555 MA, with a dramatic rise over about 25 million years in the first several stages of the Cambrian and continuing into the Ordovician. So the Cambrian explosion itself is just the rapid appearance of bilaterian phyla in the early Cambrian, but this is already at least 25, not 10 million years, lasting from 555 to 530 million years ago. Given that this study was published before Meyer's book and well before this 2021 video, he is either ignoring this information or unaware of it, neither of which looks good for someone posing as an expert. Beyond this, more recent research has changed this picture substantially. A 2018 paper titled The Two Phases of the Cambrian Explosion argues that the Cambrian encompassed two separate radiations, one of stem lineages from 542 to 513 million years ago, and one of crown lineages extending from 513 million to the start of the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event about 485 million years ago. We will elaborate on what we just said in a moment, but we should first quickly summarize the dishonesty in how ID proponents portray the Cambrian explosion. They exploit the suddenness that is implied by its name in order to pretend that enormous numbers of species showed up in an unimaginably short period of time, allowing the uneducated viewer to presume that this means almost instantaneous, as though they emerged from a puff of divine smoke. In actuality, we can now see that we are talking about around 70 million years. Although relatively brief for geologic timescales, hence the colorful name, for biological organisms this is quite a long time, plenty long enough for the impressive diversification to take place, given the intense evolutionary pressure of many animal forms suddenly in direct competition for resources. Now, let's get back to the previous point regarding lineages to further highlight Meyer's dishonesty. We need to define some terminology. Meyer is fond of saying that various animal phyla appeared in the Cambrian without predecessors, but what is a phylum in the first place? Meyer defines the term phylum in Chapter 2 of Darwin's Doubt as the highest or widest categories of biological classification in the animal kingdom, with each exhibiting a unique architecture, organizational blueprint, or structural body plan. While that sounds fine at face value, the 2000 paper, a critical reappraisal of the fossil record of the bilaterian phyla, points out why this definition is problematic. Reading, 
claims that the phyla are characterized by particular types of body plan features which putative superphyletic groupings do not possess, thus seem to be based on an artifact of how we classify groups of animals. If such superphyletic features were readily identifiable, the larger grouping would itself probably be called a phylum, as it would be recognized to be phylogenetically unified. As the level at which this ignorance of relationships becomes important is likely to vary between groups, the Cladists' standard criticism that phyla and other such ranks should be positively discouraged on the grounds that they engender spurious comparisons between members of the same rank seems to be valid. That was a bit wordy, so to simplify, we are saying that phyla, like other taxonomic ranks, are largely arbitrary. So we should concern ourselves less with whether or not some animals fall into a particular phylum, and more with whether the features they possess are explicable under evolution. As we will see, this is definitely the case. This paper also defines body plan as a set of features plesiomorphically shared by extant taxa in a monophyletic clade. That word plesiomorphically just refers to traits that are shared by all the members of a group but are not unique to that group. So while this adds objectivity to our definition, it also means we can't necessarily equate a phylum with a particular group of organisms that share a body plan. For example, insects share a body plan that is a modified version of the common arthropod body plan. All of the features shared by arthropods are present in insects, but not all the features shared by insects are present in all arthropods, such as wings and six legs. This brings us to two other terms we need to be familiar with before proceeding, those being crown and stem. This paper defines both. The crown group of a phylum consists of the last common ancestor of all living forms in the phylum and all of its descendants. The stem group consists of a series of entirely extinct organisms leading up to the crown group away from the last common ancestor of this phylum and the most closely related phylum. To take one example, trilobites, chelicerates, myriapods, crustaceans, and insects are all crown arthropods, but the Cambrian forms Opabinia and Anomalocaris are stem arthropods because they lack features diagnostic of the crown group, like a sclerotized exoskeleton, tagmosis, and specialized appendages. Some might even call them transitional species. At any rate, this claim that the animals of the Cambrian have no predecessors in the Precambrian is one of Meyer's central theses. Here he is making the same claim in a PragerU video called Evolution, Bacteria to Beethoven, since one propaganda outlet doesn't seem to be enough for him. And with an image of a bacterium right next to a primate, we can tell we're going to get some Kent Hovind level dishonesty on this one. First, the Cambrian explosion. A weird and wonderful thing happened 530 million years ago. A whole bunch of major groups of animals, what scientists call the phyla, appeared abruptly within a geologically short window of time, about 10 million years. These novel animal forms exhibiting prototypes of most animal body designs we see today emerged in the fossil record without evidence of earlier ancestors. Did you catch that? Yes, Stephen, we caught you lying on the internet. It's not that shocking. Let's now properly examine Cambrian radiation to thoroughly expose one of Meyer's biggest and most persistent lies. This will get a little technical, but bear with me. We need to see how thoroughly he contradicts real science. The earliest current evidence of animals dates to about 650 million years ago in rocks from Oman. This evidence comes from molecules called steranes, specifically ratios of certain steranes unique to sponges and a few other eukaryotes. Researchers have concluded after some debate that the ratios of those particular steranes and the varieties present are indicative of sponges instead of algae or protists. I'll link to the relevant studies for those interested in digging into this research. But in short, researchers have tended to regard the presence of those steranes starting at about 650 million years ago as the earliest evidence of animals. 
Following the Cryogenian period, the Ediacaran period extended from 635 to 541 million years ago. It is in this period, not the Cambrian, that we find the first animal body fossils. From 635 to 590 million years ago, the evidence of animals includes putative cnidarians like Lantianella and phosphatized animal embryos. These embryos, too, have been the subject of extensive debate since they were first discovered in the 1990s. Interestingly, their first description pinned them as animal embryos, but later studies had regarded them as potentially being protists, algae, or even giant bacteria. A recent study investigated a large number of these potential embryos and found that at least some of them are developmentally complex enough to be animal embryos, including Megasphera, Caviosphera, and Helicoforamina, rejecting algal and protestin assignment. Acrotarchs also attained some evolutionary innovations at the start of the Ediacaran, developing conspicuous ornamentation, possibly due to coevolution with the newly evolved eumetazoans. Again, some definitions might help. Eumetazoa includes all animals that aren't sponges. Sponges are the most basally derived animals, and eumetazoa encompasses tenophores, placozoans, cnidarians, and then all the bilaterians. More information on these clades can be found in my zoology series. Interestingly, experimental evidence has revealed that both sponges and tenophores have low oxygen requirements, which makes sense given that only the ocean's surface was oxygenated until the middle Ediacaran. Finally, 571 million years ago, we find the first macroscopic communities. The organisms from 571 to 541 million years ago are lumped into three assemblages, or recurrent community compositions. The Avalon from 571 to 555 million years ago, the White Sea from 560 to 551 million years ago, and the Nama from 555 to 541 million years ago. It is from these assemblages that the classic Ediacaran biota hail, also known as Vendian biota. The affinities of these organisms, or compatibility with certain taxa, are extremely important for understanding the Cambrian explosion. When first described in the 1940s, the mysterious Ediacarans were written off as a failed early experiment in evolution. Indeed, this was still the case when Stephen Jay Gould wrote the popular book Wonderful Life in the late 1980s, which is why ID proponents love to quote Gould, because they pretend his eminence in the field weighs more than the obsolescence of his quotations. At that time, they were thought to be independently multicellular protists, fungi, or lichens, while homologies with animals were few and far between. As time has gone on, better technology has improved our ability to understand these organisms, and a wealth of new fossils has radically changed the picture. As a 2016 paper notes, further, Ediacaran candidate animals were probably dominated by deep stem group representatives of various modern clades. Thus, perhaps not surprisingly, the phylogenetic interpretation of putative Ediacaran animal fossils is not straightforward. Many of them have suggestive but not definitive characters for phylogenetic placement, presenting tantalizing but frustrating cases for animal affinities. It has also been claimed by some, like paleontologist Gregory Redelac, that Ediacaran communities were terrestrial rather than marine, and that some of the more famous Ediacarans, like Dickinsonia, were lichens. Both of these conclusions have been heavily disputed. The terrestrial Ediacaran hypothesis contradicts, according to one paper, abundant data collected during decades of detailed sedimentological and geological research by numerous international authors. The earliest of these assemblages, the Avalon assemblage, is dominated by the sessile frondose fractal rangiomorphs, such as charnia and fractofusis, frond-like arboreomorphs like charniodiscus, and strange disc-like organisms such as cyclomedusa. Their affinities have been extensively debated from algae to fungi to stem animals to crown animals. 
Recent work has pinned the bizarre rangiomorphs as stem eumetazoans. According to a 2021 paper, Charnia masoni maintains differentiation of elements with concurrent axially delineated inflation, exhibits evidence for transitions in the primary developmental mode, and is compatible with indeterminate growth, and the form of the organism is regular and predictable. This combination of characters is only otherwise seen within the metazoa. Algae do not display a conserved form, and fungal fruiting bodies do not display the maintained differentiation of new elements. Therefore, using these data in tandem with a large multicellular organization, we conclude that there is no justification for considering an affinity for charnia outside the animal total group. If true, then arboreomorphs could also be stem eumetazoans. Another very interesting Avalonian is Heusha quadriformis from 560 million years ago, which has been convincingly shown to be a cnidarian, the same clade containing modern jellyfish. Next, many of the famous Ediacarans hail from the White Sea assemblage, such as Tribrachidium, Dickinsonia, Icaria, and Kimberella. First, Tribrachidium is a strange organism plausibly interpreted as another stem eumetazoan, being a member of the extinct phylum Trilobozoa. It was evidently a sessile benthic suspension feeder with triradial symmetry. Second, Dickinsonia is perhaps the most famous of the Ediacarans, and despite a long contentious history, Ichnological, developmental, and biomarker evidence have argued strongly in favor of stem bilaterian affinity. As Dickinsonia is a member of the extinct phylum Proarticulata, this conclusion applies equally to the whole clade. Third, Icaria is a recently discovered bilaterian from South Australia. According to the paper that described it, we find that the size and morphology of Icaria match predictions for the progenitor of the trace fossil Helminthoid ichnites, indicative of mobility and sediment displacement. Lastly, Kimberella is another historically contentious fossil with affinities ranging from Cnidarian to Mollusk. More recent analyses have tended to settle on stem Mollusk or stem Spiralian affinities, the latter of which is the clade encompassing mollusks, annelids, rotifers, brachiopods, and many other familiar invertebrates. The final Ediacaran assemblage is the Nama, and evidently an extinction occurred at the beginning of this period, drastically reducing biodiversity. Following the extinction event, we find fossils like Claudina, Yelingia, and Nama Calathus. Claudina is a tubular biomineralized animal that has recently been argued to be an annelid based on the possible remains of a digestive tract found in some specimens. Some relatives of Claudina, collectively termed Claudinomorphs, have been argued as cnidarians, so Claudinomorphs may not actually represent a single monophyletic clade. More fossils are needed to confirm this. As for Yelingia, this segmented bilaterian is proposed to be either an annelid or panarthropod, the clade containing tardigrades, velvet worms, and arthropods. The latter affinity is evidenced by each segment bearing three lobes, similar to trilobites. Third, pyrotized soft tissue in Namakalathus appears to support assignment as an early relative of brachiopods and bryozoans. At this point, it's completely ridiculous to even imply that there are no animals in the Precambrian. There are a host of fossils that can easily be interpreted as animals preceding the Cambrian, giving no support to Meyer's repeated claim that animals just appeared out of nowhere. One has to presume that Meyer is aware of most or all of the research I just cited and have linked below and is deliberately ignoring it. But there's another issue here that goes deeper than merely pointing out the existence of animals in the Precambrian that Meyer tries to hide. It is that the evolution of Ediacaran animals follows a gradual stepwise pattern, completely in line with evolutionary principles. 
when the Ediacarans first show up around 570 million years ago, like the Rangiomorphs, they are all soft-bodied. But between 560 and 550 million years ago, the first organic-walled, non-biomineralized forms appear, such as Corumbella and Shanksilithes. Finally, around 550 million years ago, the first hardened, biomineralized animals showed up, like Claudina, collectively called the small shelly fauna. Along with these organisms, we see a proliferation of trace fossils, indicative of various motile animals. And though most of the bizarre Ediacarans perished by 541 million years ago, a select few, such as Claudina and Swartpuntia, straggled into the early Cambrian, indicating an undeniable continuity of faunas. Since that was a lot of information, it's worth pausing for a moment before diving into the Cambrian radiations to think about just what ID proponents mean to propose instead of evolution for all of these organisms. Did the designer create the first eukaryotes separately from those of the Cambrian? Did the designer design successive related or unrelated assemblages piecemeal throughout the Ediacaran? Are any of the Precambrian animals related to any of the Cambrian ones? Is the Precambrian Claudina related to the Cambrian Claudina? How do we differentiate designed organisms from non-designed? The simple fact is that there is no intelligent design model to explain the Precambrian animals, or as we shall see momentarily, the Cambrian either. I repeat, there is no model. There is nothing to test and no attempt to correlate or explain. They simply ignore all the data that contradicts the desired conclusion and say God did it. This is why intelligent design truly, fundamentally, undeniably isn't science not because of any materialist agenda, but because it doesn't do the things that science does. Moving forward, given all of this Precambrian preamble, how does this contribute to our understanding of the Cambrian itself? The last of the soft-bodied and organic-walled Ediacarans fizzled out in the early Cambrian, and this was likely due to competition with the newly evolved biomineralized animals. As a 2016 paper argues, these biomineralized animals were equipped with innovative adaptations of active feeding modes and sediment restructuring capabilities, biomineralized armament against predators, generalist and opportunist adaptability to varying substrates, sexual and asexual reproduction for enhanced dispersal, resilience to environmental disturbance, and presumably high fecundity and rapid achievement of sexual maturity. The first evidence of predation in the form of boreholes in Claudina fossils indicate that there were novel selective pressures in the terminal Ediacaran, which likely helped drive evolutionary arms races between predators and prey. Furthermore, bioturbation of sediments, meaning disturbance of sedimentary deposits by living organisms, expanded vertically in the late Ediacaran, disrupting the cyanobacterial mats upon which Ediacaran organisms grew, which also likely led to their extinction. As for environmental factors, oceanic oxygen levels continued to rise into the Cambrian, significantly lifting size restraints on organisms. In addition, greater oxygen levels also allowed for longer food chains, and thus highly complex food webs. A general rule is that 10% of the total energy stored in biomass is available from each trophic level to the next, on the so-called ecological pyramid. Respiration with oxygen is the most efficient way to convert biomass into energy, so more oxygen means more trophic levels and more complicated ecosystems. Indeed, the Cambrian is the first time we see complex ecosystems with many styles of feeding, including apex predators. Some researchers have pointed to modern polychaete feeding ecology in support of this. When oxygen levels are higher, there are more predatory polychaetes. 
Analogously, this too would have contributed to the evolutionary arms race in the early Cambrian, and this immaculately sets the stage for the Cambrian explosion itself, which occurred in a series of steps. The trace fossil record of the early Cambrian is indicative of a major diversification event, as indicated by ichnotaxa, or taxa based on fossilized remains. Burrowing abilities in the latest Ediacaran are all horizontal, with the first vertical examples appearing at the start of the Cambrian, along with arthropod trace fossils. The global maximum of ichnogenera rose from 10 to 42 across the Cambrian boundary, but the deepest vertical burrows only dug a few centimeters into the substrate. This first age of the Cambrian is called the Fortunian, and it lasted from 541 to 535 million years ago. The second stage of the Cambrian, also called the Timotian, lasted from 535 to 525 million years ago, and the global maximum of ichnogenera rose to 43. Bioturbation markedly increased during this time as organisms were burrowing deeper than they had been previously. Global ichnodiversity rose again to 55 genera in the next age, the Adabanian, which lasted from 525 to 514 million years ago, and the behavioral complexity indicated by trace fossils was greater compared to the preceding Timotion. Cambrian stage 4 lasted from 514 to 510 million years ago and showed no increase in ichnodiversity or behavioral complexity. As the 2014 paper concludes, the initial diversification, Fortunian, is coincident with the appearance of the first sediment bulldozers, but preceded the establishment of infaunal suspension feeder faunas that were ecosystem engineers of paramount role, Cambrian stage two. In turn, the rapid increase in depth and extent of bioturbation associated with these suspension feeding communities may have triggered another diversification event of biogenic structures that took place during Cambrian stage three and involved the appearance of new behaviors by deposit feeders. Capture of organic particles by suspension feeders allowed enrichment of organics by biodeposition, promoting diversification of infaunal deposit feeders. Therefore, infaunal suspension feeders may have been ecological drivers of the Cambrian stage three diversification phase of biogenic activity, representing a dramatic case of ecological spillover. What this picture indicates is that a big chunk of the Cambrian explosion occurred in a stepwise fashion over the course of about 27 million years, from 541 to 514 million years ago. Clearly, the gradual nature of this event speaks to evolutionary causes, not supernatural ones, and we even have firm ecological explanations for these steps, as we just discussed. This will become even more apparent with the next few examples. A 2018 paper broadly describes the two phases of the Cambrian explosion as indicated by body fossils. The first phase lasted from 560 to 513 million years ago and was dominated by non-bilaterians, such as porphyrins, tenophores, and cnidarians, as well as stem bilaterian lineages. Notably, stem lophophorates like hyaliths and timodiids, as well as stem mollusks like halciariids, wiwaxiids, and halcyonelloids, comprise most of the spiralians of this period. At 513 million years ago, an extinction event occurred called the Sinsk extinction, and this wiped out many of the stem lineages, allowing the crown lineages to predominate. Crown group brachiopods, bivalves, and gastropods diversified in the second phase, which lasted from 513 to 485 million years ago, followed by the appearance of cephalopods and bryozoans near the end of the period. Okay, let's regroup for a moment. I know that was a lot of information, and I'm sorry to have to put you through all that, but it was necessary. Meyer presents himself as a scholar and academic, and he's able to do this because he has rehearsed terminology that is unfamiliar to most people. That's how he comes off as an expert. He uses words most people don't know, and he uses them confidently. 
That's all it takes to trick a lot of people. But when you compare what he says to the scientific literature, which he knows almost no one will ever do, you can see that he's just completely full of shit. After looking at dozens of studies that profoundly contradict everything he says, it becomes clear that everything about the Cambrian explosion from what preceded it to the actual unfolding of the event and the aftermath perfectly matches what we expect from evolution. We see the progressive stepwise evolution of animals where sponges, cnidarians, and stem bilaterians show up first followed by a diversification of crown bilaterians. This makes no sense in the context of intelligent design. And again, ID proponents do not have a model of any kind to explain the events of the Cambrian explosion. All they can do is lie about science and pretend to poke holes in evolution as though that would substantiate any alternative, scientific or otherwise. With this information now understood, we can all resoundingly conclude that Meyer's book, Darwin's Doubt, is complete and utter garbage. Of course, this is old news. Essentially, everyone with relevant expertise who reviewed the book when it was published said as much themselves. And of course, the DI had their stock responses ready as damage control. Every scientist who criticizes it is a moron, or misrepresenting the book, or didn't focus on the main points. It's just deflection after deflection, like an abusive, gaslighting, alcoholic boyfriend. But this charade should be pretty transparent at this point. It's an empty gesture for thoughtless followers who want any reason whatsoever to dismiss these criticisms point blank without a moment's thought and have the lowest standards imaginable for such judgments. Okay, ready to get back to the science? Moving on chronologically from the Cambrian explosion, Meyer lies about every other era he attempts to discuss. But the Cambrian explosion isn't the only such event in the history of life. There are many. Uh, a little bit later in the fossil record, there's an event called the Great Ordovician Biodiversity Event, or GOBI, where there's a whole slew of new forms of life that come into existence. And then as you go up the f and down the, the sedimentary column, you find that the first winged insects, the first, uh, the first dinosaurs, the first turtles, the first birds, the first uh, marine reptiles, the first flowering plants, uh, that the, the first flowering, flowering plants come into the fossil record in an event that's now known as the, 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 the big bloom, the biological big bloom. And then another striking event occurs in the Eocene period where you get the first mammals and where there are between 15 and, and 17 new orders of mammals that come suddenly into to the fossil record, again, with no discernible connection to similar creatures in the lower strata beneath the Eocene. Every single one of those claims is flat out wrong. Let's take them one by one. First, the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event, or GOBI, was an evolutionary event that occurred in the period following the Cambrian, which involved the replacement of the more generalized Cambrian fauna with more specialized marine fauna that would be common throughout the remainder of the Paleozoic era. GOBI occurred in two phases. Animal diversity increased somewhat in the early Ordovician, followed by a sharp increase in the middle Ordovician. The benefactors of Gobi include, among others, stromatoporoid sponges, corals, brachiopods, echinoderms, trilobites, ostracods, bryozoans, and nautiloids. In fact, the number of species on Earth tripled during Gobi. Now, there are a couple of problems for Meyer with regard to Gobi. First, this event doesn't fit with Meyer's idea of phylum level intelligent design. Fine scale resolutions of animal evolution during Gobi reveal that the radiation is merely an extension of the Cambrian explosion. For the first problem, let's define some terminology. Disparity refers to the differences between clades, while diversity refers to variations within clades. 
Therefore, the Cambrian explosion was a radiation of disparity, while Gobi was a radiation of diversity. Or to use Meyer's terminology, we see the origin of body plants in the Cambrian and variations on those body plants in the Ordovician. Remember that according to Meyer, a phylum equates with a body plan, but no known phyla originated in the Ordovician. Instead, the Ordovician saw the evolution of different species within those previously established phyla. In some cases, we can see the step-by-step -step evolution of certain clades, such as trilobites. No sign of intelligent design to be had, and nothing but lies from Meyer. Continuing, as discussed previously, the second phase of the Cambrian explosion, in which crown lineages underwent a radiation of their own, lasted right up to the end of the Cambrian. The transition from the Cambrian radiations to Gobi is so seamless that some papers have included the late Cambrian as part of it. A 2020 paper defines Gobi as lasting 30 million years, from 497 to 467 million years ago. Then, at the end of the Ordovician, an extinction occurred, reducing species diversity, but this was followed by a radiation at the start of the Silurian. In other words, we see continuous natural processes occurring, not isolated supernatural ones. Next, Meyer said the first winged insects appeared without predecessors. We have to wonder what he could possibly mean by this. After all, arthropods evolved in the Cambrian and the subphylum that includes insects and their closest six-legged cousins, like springtails, is called hexapoda. Molecular clocks estimate that the common ancestor of hexapoda lived in the early Ordovician, while the last common ancestor of insects lived either in the late Silurian or early Devonian. The earliest insect fossil is a pair of mandibles called Rhyniognatha from Scotland dating to about 412 million years ago, which is early Devonian age. Though these may have belonged to a winged insect, there are no wings associated with the fossils, and the earliest winged insect fossil dates to the Carboniferous some 324 million years ago. As insects are phylogenetically nested within the paraphyletic crustaceans, it also makes perfect evolutionary sense that fossil crustaceans are found before the first fossil insects, like those Ordovician ostracods. Finally, Insecta is a class of arthropods, so by Meyer's classification, insects represent deviations on the arthropod body plan, not independent body plans, making his claim of without predecessors totally nonsensical. Of course, the major innovation of insects over their hexapod cousins is wings and the power of flight that accompanies them. While we can all hear a creationist in our heads flipping out about how wings could suddenly appear, let's all learn about this process together. Developmental analyses of the genes involved in wing formation have shown that crustacean orthologue genes called vestigial, nubbin, and apterus were likely accepted for new purposes, meaning a purpose other than its original function. Further, the origin of the wings involved mergers between different tissues from the limbs and abdomen, rather than the wholesale invention of new tissues. So the evolution of wings was about changing and rearranging existing tissues and genes, not inventing new ones. The story is similar with the first dinosaurs. Amniotes, or tetrapods whose embryos are surrounded by an amnion during development, evolved from reptiliomorphs in the late Carboniferous about 330 million years ago and split into the two clades Sauropsida and Synapsida shortly thereafter, about 312 million years ago. The latter contains mammals and their extinct relatives, whom we'll return to in a little bit, and the former contains all so-called reptiles and birds. The common ancestor of lepidosaurs, which includes lizards and snakes, as well as archosaurs, which includes crocodilians and birds, lived in the late Permian about 259 million years ago, as evidenced by fossils like Proterosaurus and the earliest dinosauromorphs, like Acillosaurus and Luisuchus, date to the early Triassic. The first dinosaurs appeared in the late Triassic about 233 million years ago, such as Herrerasaurus, Eoraptor, and Saturnalia. 
Again, no sign of any intelligent design, just slow and gradual change. Turtles have a good fossil record as well. The evolution of the turtle's unique morphology is exquisitely documented in transitional fossils such as Unotosaurus, Papasheles, Odontosheles, and Proganosheles. Next, at present, the earliest known bird is Archaeopteryx from the late Jurassic, but this isn't even the oldest feathered dinosaur. Zautingia, Anchiornis, and Aurornis predate Archaeopteryx and show evidence of feathers. Like the evolution of flight in insects, the evolution of flight in birds involved a lot of mergers. Many bones fused to make flight easier, and flight feathers were accepted from insulating feathers. By the way, if you want to make a creationist's head explode, inform them that scales and feathers are made of the same protein, keratin, simply in different arrangements, and that a single point mutation in certain chickens causes them to grow feathers where scales should be. Moving on, the first marine reptiles refers to ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, and placodonts, all of whom evolved in the early Triassic. Yet again, we have fossils documenting these transitions. Though ichthyosaurs are fully aquatic, paleontologists have found early Triassic sauropsids that are related to them but do not display such extreme specializations, including the Hupasuchians and Cartorhynchus. Plesiosaurs have semi-aquatic relatives like Nothosaurs and Pachypleurosaurs, and there are even transitional placodonts known, such as Palatodonta. The origin of the first flowering plants had actually been a bit of a mystery, and there is indeed a bit of debate around them. However, recent analyses of fossil clades like the Benetitales, Pentoxylales, and Gigantoteriales have helped narrow the gap between molecular and fossil estimates for the origin of flowers. Just last year, a Jurassic angiosperm was found, meeting predictions for flower evolution based on molecular estimates. And yet again, the evolution of flowers was largely about the modification of existing structures. All the floral organs, sepals, petals, androecium, and gynoecium are simply modified leaves. More on plant evolution in my botany series if you're interested. So we've got transitional species that lead to flowering plants, all the kinds of insects, reptiles, amphibians, birds. Isn't it fun to learn about all the organisms the DI pretends never existed? Finally, Meyer actually said the first mammals appeared in the Eocene. This is completely laughably incorrect. Remember from earlier that mammals nest within the larger clade of synapsids, the earliest of which appeared in the Carboniferous. Stem synapsid fossils are known all throughout the Permian and Triassic, and the first crown mammals appeared in the Jurassic. For reference, the Eocene epoch lasted from 56 to 34 million years ago, but the crown mammal Frutifossor is dated to 150 million years ago. Way, way, way off, Steve. Relatives of all three extant mammal clades, the monotremes, marsupials, and placentals, are known from well before the Eocene. This is a really embarrassing error on his part. Of course, we all know that Meyer isn't a paleontologist, but he still should have done an ounce of research before making this absurd statement. So to finally conclude this very long section on fossils, Meyer is wrong on all points. He is lying about an absence of transitional species for every single era of biological history he opens his mouth about. And beyond this, he provides absolutely no justification for how intelligent design is a better model than evolution, or how it even qualifies as a model in the first place. Just lies, and God did it. This is a profound insult to the entire scientific community, in particular the scientists who put in the work to find, prepare, analyze, and categorize these fossils, and Meyer deserves nothing but contempt and ridicule for it. Okay, my friends, now we will move on to a shorter but equally important assessment of his second main gripe with evolution, genetics. 
The reason this won't take as long as it took to go over all that paleontology literature is that for most of these points, we won't have to reference anything other than a freshman year undergraduate understanding of genetics. That's how clueless Meyer is when he opens his mouth about DNA. Let's sample some of his stupidity. If, if the Darwinian mechanism lacks the creative power to generate the, the large scale what are called morphological innovations, the big changes in form that arise in the fossil record. That raises the question, well, what, what could produce those new forms of life? And what we know from biology is that whenever you see new forms of life arising, you also have to have new information. It's very much like in our computer world. If you want to give your computer a new function, you have to provide code. You have to provide information in the form of software. And something very similar is true in life. If you want to build a new form of animal life, you have to have new organs and tissues. But new organs and tissues require new dedicated proteins to service those organs and tissues. For example, many of the animals that came into the uh, fossil record in the Cambrian period had, 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 had a gut. But guts require digestive enzymes, and digestive enzymes are proteins, and proteins are built in accord with the instructions stored on the DNA molecule. So as you see these explosions of form in the Cambrian period or other periods in the history of life, what you're also seeing, therefore, is explosions of biological information. Biological form requires biological information, genetic information, and other forms of information. And that raises the question, where did that information come from? Now, what we know from our uniform and repeated experience which is the basis of all scientific reasoning about the past, is that information, especially in a digital form, always comes from an intelligent source, whether we're talking about a paragraph in a book, or a section of software, or a hieroglyphic inscription, or even information embedded in a radio signal. Whenever we see information and we trace it back to its ultimate source, we inevitably find a mind, not a material process. Well, if the mutation selection mechanism is not capable of generating the amount of information necessary to build new forms of life, then a better explanation is actually intelligent design. It's that a mind played a role in the origin of those new forms of life. And that's consistent with everything we know about the cause and effect structure of the world. Okay, so he does this all the time. Computers use code, and humans created that code, so all codes have a creator. This talking point is on every ID bingo card. This is Kent Hovind level tripe. Someone created this cup I'm using, so everything was created. It's mind-bogglingly stupid and a dishonest talking point. To get more specific, he complains about digestive organs requiring digestive enzymes without bothering to make the obvious conclusion that the enzymes can predate the organ, and also that rudimentary organs complexify over time. He's trying to pretend science is suggesting that something like the human stomach appeared out of nowhere millions of years ago, which is ridiculous. But to get to the heart of the matter, Meyer is a complete dumpster fire when it comes to the concept of information. We know from our experience that information always arises from an intelligent source. Um, whether we're looking at hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book, or information in a section of software code, or even information embedded in a radio signal. Whenever we see information and we trace it back to its source, it always comes to a mind, not a, an undirected material process. He wants the viewer to believe that information is a material substance that needs to be forged by intelligence, rather than what it really is, a pattern or sequence of items. If nucleotides polymerize to form a nucleic acid, and that sequence acts as a template for the synthesis of another molecule, it's information. It's just a word we use to describe something that exists, and it has zero implications toward intelligence. Let's watch him milk this computer analogy some more. What happens if you introduce a few random changes into computer code? You'll likely mess it up, right? Though it might still work, if you don't make too many changes. But if you make enough random changes, your program will stop functioning altogether. 
you certainly can't keep doing this and expect some cool new program to pop out. There is so much wrong here. First, he insists upon an excessive accumulation of random changes to the code, which is not how biology works, nor how software works. He ignores both natural selection and principles of coding. Not that it matters for biology, but when programmers allow programs to make changes to their own code, also known as self-modifying code, with feedback mechanisms in place, we do not get what Meyer says. We instead see a kind of evolution in action, with a gradual improvement in performance and efficiency, similar to biological evolution. But more importantly, in terms of DNA, again, no one is proposing that there are loads and loads of random changes occurring very rapidly in one organism. That would be the equivalent of someone getting blasted by huge amounts of radiation, like a Chernobyl event, and sustaining a ridiculous amount of mutations. Guess what? That person would certainly develop loads of tumors and die. That's perfectly analogous to his program that has its code changed randomly and dramatically, such that it doesn't work anymore. That's not how evolution works. Mutations crop up slowly and are selected for from one organism to the next. Each organism must be viable for any mutations to proliferate to the next generation. Evolution is not just mutations, it's mutations and natural selection. When we want to engineer enzymes to perform a novel activity, the best strategy is to speed up nature. We use random mutagenesis and select the best mutant. Run the cycle 10 times, each time picking the best mutant, and you get a highly efficient enzyme. It's evolution in vitro, not design. Similarly, if you let a program change its code with a feedback mechanism in place analogous to natural selection, the code will improve. This concept is not just an analogy, but actually directly relevant to the concept of evolution by natural selection. Stevie, do you think we can drop this computer code thing anytime soon? If, if you're a computer programmer, you know that if you start randomly changing the sections of functional code, you're going to degrade that code long before you ever come up with a new program or operating system. Okay, buddy. Unfortunately for Meyer, it gets much worse than this. He frequently makes the claim that mutations cause degradation of information. Mutations degrade information, but minds generate information, and therefore, mind provides a better explanation for the origin of information than the Darwinian mechanism. This is one of my favorite sentences Meyer has ever said, because it demonstrates what an unbelievable moron he is. Mutations degrade information is a meaningless sentence that can serve no purpose other than to capitalize on the complete and total ignorance of his viewers toward what DNA is and how gene expression works. For people who don't know what any of these words mean, their personal connotation with the word mutation will probably be of that of toxic green goo, bad nasty mutation ooze that dissolves kittens and all of their information. In reality, to anyone who remembers their ninth grade biology, mutations are simply changes in the nucleotide sequence of a gene. For those who are a bit rusty, I have a very short and very clear tutorial on transcription and translation in my biochemistry series. But in short, a gene is transcribed to generate an mRNA, which is then translated to produce a protein. And any change in the sequence found in the gene may result in a change in a particular amino acid in the protein. A different sequence of nucleotides yielding a different sequence of amino acids. That's it. For the organism, some mutations are bad, the vast majority are neutral, and improved function by random mutation is observed in viral and bacterial evolution every single day, both in culture and in vivo. So he would be wrong even if he was talking about cellular function, but he isn't. He said information. Again, as though referring to some nebulous magical entity that is separate from the DNA itself. 
mutations simply change the information. They don't degrade it. And Meyer is profoundly stupid for having said so. He pulls this crap all the time. Unless the chemical letters in the DNA text are sequenced properly, a protein molecule will not form. Nope. As long as the resulting mRNA has a start codon, the sequence can be literally anything, and the corresponding protein will be produced. Astounding. In all codes and languages, there are vastly more ways of arranging characters that will generate gibberish than there are arrangements that will generate meaningful sequences. And this applies to DNA. Remember, natural selection only selects sequences that random mutations generate. Yet experiments have established that DNA sequences capable of making stable proteins are extremely rare and thus really hard to stumble on randomly. Even more astounding, he claims sequences that produce stable proteins are extremely rare when in actuality literally any sequence would produce a protein that is perfectly stable. There is nothing inherently unstable about proteins. Again, as long as there is a start codon present in the resulting mRNA so that translation can begin, the rest of the sequence is irrelevant. Every possible three-letter sequence is a codon that corresponds to an amino acid. So no matter what the sequence, a protein will be produced. And proteins don't just fall apart for no reason, no matter what the sequence of amino acids. So any sequence will result in a stable protein. This so few stable proteins thing is an even dumber lie than the lie he meant to tell, which is that very few proteins have biological function. This is obviously what he meant because this is what he goes on to talk about. How rare? While working at Cambridge University, molecular biologist Douglas Ack showed that for every DNA sequence that generates a relatively short functional protein, there are 10 to the 77th power non-functional sequences. Of course, Axe is just another DI clown, so it's not a surprise that this is who he references. It's also not a surprise that they are both profoundly wrong. This is just another example of the wow, big, scary numbers game that ID proponents play. First, when insisting that 10 to the 77 proteins would not have any function, he is pretending that he made all of these proteins and tested their functionality. He has no idea what functionality all those sequences would produce. Many new sequences could have any number of other functions. What they mean to say is that all those other proteins would not have this particular function held by the protein in question, which is also unbelievably wrong. If a protein, such as an enzyme, has a particular sequence, they would have you believe that this is the only sequence that would result in this function. That's ridiculous. There are hundreds of amino acid residues in a protein, and most of them could be many different amino acids. Anyone who thinks switching one random leucine to isoleucine would result in a non-functional protein is an idiot. A dramatic change from a hydrophobic to hydrophilic residue, for example, might change the folding pattern slightly, and this may or may not change binding affinity, which could become worse or better. But many of the 20 amino acids are chemically very similar, and swapping them would result in no change for the protein at nearly all of the positions in the protein. I repeat, there is plenty of variability at virtually every single amino acid residue in any protein, barring key residues in active sites. Therefore, the number of amino acid sequences that would result in a protein that carries out precisely the same function is astronomical. Would you like proof? Take any enzyme, like a polymerase enzyme, which copies DNA during replication, and look at its sequence in different organisms. What do you know? The sequences are not identical. They differ from species to species, despite carrying out precisely the same function. Let's say it again for emphasis. 
there are different versions of the same enzyme in different species that perform the same exact function. Clearly, nature finds something by chance that carries out a function. This protein is retained and is then slowly optimized over millions of years, or potentially accepted for another purpose, with neutral mutations cropping up along the way that we can use as molecular clocks to trace lineages. Anytime you hear an ID proponent start to go off on odds of 1 in 10 to the 120 to the billion or whatever, you know immediately that they are totally clueless and just rattling off big numbers for shock value. This completes the analysis of Meyer's lies about genetics that require only a modest recollection of freshman year biology to spot. Now let's get a little more technical so that we can make a few more sophisticated points. Let's recall how evolution works broadly before looking at certain organisms more specifically. Organismal variations are the result of mutations, and in sexually reproducing organisms, recombination, which occurs during meiosis, as I explain in my biology series. There are a variety of types of mutations, including point mutations, deletions or insertions, inversions, transpositions, and duplications. Of course, Meyer likes to pretend that point mutations, or a change in one base pair, are the only game in town. Or, who knows, maybe he really knows so little about genetics. At any rate, biologists understand that mutation and recombination occur naturally, due to exogenous mutagens and also replicative error in the cell. Any organism accumulates dozens of mutations even in early embryonic development. These mutations can affect an organism's capacity to survive in a given environment. Beneficial mutations promote survival and therefore reproduction. Harmful mutations hinder them and neutral mutations have no effect. Thus, mutations will spread at different rates throughout populations depending on their effect, and these rates can be tracked in organisms that have short generations. Again, though the vast majority of mutations are neutral, some beneficial mutations have been detected in real time. Perhaps the most famous of these occurred in the Richard Lenski long-term E. coli experiment, where one population developed the ability to metabolize citrate in an aerobic environment. This happened because of a gene duplication that placed a gene which was only activated in anaerobic conditions under the control of a promoter that operated in aerobic conditions, thus conferring a novel phenotype. This concept of promoters is covered in my tutorial on regulation of gene expression, but the important thing to understand is that even without a new gene, it is merely the new location for the duplicated gene elsewhere in the genome, which bestowed the organism with a novel cellular function. There are many other ways large-scale change can occur. Earlier, we mentioned the point mutation that causes the production of feathers instead of scales, but even more significant alterations to body plan can occur as well. ID proponents like to pretend that organs found in modern animals had to instantly form precisely as they are today, but in reality, one need only look at organ formation during embryonic development to see how a slight difference in the instructions or the placement of cytoplasmic determinants can change the way cell layers are folded to dramatically alter their layout, as well as precisely how and when cells differentiate in order to produce new organs whose functions can optimize over long timescales. We can even look at simple forms of extant life to see just how simple some of these organs can be. And a modern understanding of Hox genes and tail genes reveals the manner in which relatively few genes coordinate the developing body plan for all of you metazoa, and therefore how a few changes in these genes can easily result in dramatically different body plans. Meyer is equally clueless when he cites what has been called the waiting time problem, or the idea that changes requiring multiple coordinated mutations are impossible because it would take so long for those specific mutations to occur from the standpoint of probability. And the waiting times problem has emerged as, as evolutionary biologists have realized 
that certain biological traits or anatomical features would require coordinated mutations. And whereas a single mutation might not take that long to occur, we might not have to wait very long on average for a single mutation to occur. With each additional mutation, the waiting times, the expected waiting times for such an event to occur rises exponentially. And so if you have complex adaptations or anatomical structures that would require multiple coordinated mutations, you're going to, by the math of population genetics, the mathematical expression of neo-Darwinian theory, you're going to have to wait an enormously long time on average for such mutations to occur, such coordinated mutations to occur. And so once you get beyond about three coordinated mutations, the waiting times rise dramatically, exponentially, into the hundreds of millions or billions of years, far more time than is allowed for the appearance of given anatomical traits as we find them arising in the fossil record. This argument ignores many obvious facts. It implies that nature must be directed towards specific sets of mutations, which it isn't. There is no target. It implies that each mutation along the way can't have any quantifiable benefit that could then be selected for, which makes their calculations totally unreasonable since their concept of coordination becomes meaningless. It implies that the changes must occur in a sequence rather than occurring in parallel fashion across a population, when in fact many different mutations can indeed be arising simultaneously across the population. And it also ignores recombination in sexual reproduction, which baselessly discounts the profound evolutionary benefit of this form of reproduction, which is the mixing and matching of genotypes thus dramatically accelerating the accumulation of beneficial mutations that again can be arising in parallel fashion across a population. The whole argument is ignorant of what evolution is and does, which is why it is astounding that a handful of papers from ID proponents citing this argument somehow made it into peer-reviewed journals, despite having been thoroughly discredited by biologists. People like Meyer have a field day whenever there is a real paper they can point to, as it almost never happens. But unfortunately, the science just isn't there. In general, given enough time, separate populations develop their own mutations, and this ultimately leads to reproductive isolation, also known as speciation. This can occur over long stretches of time, or in some cases, a single generation, depending on the organism. Plants, for instance, often speciate by whole genome duplication, or polyploidy, but this has also been observed in some animals. For example, the marbled crayfish Procambarus virginalis speciated from its ancestral species, Procambarus phallax, in the 1990s due to a whole genome duplication. That we have physically observed speciation events is another dirty secret that many creationists don't like to acknowledge. At first, sister species are very similar to each other, differing only slightly in genetics, morphology, and perhaps behavior. But over the course of generations, these differences become more and more pronounced. For instance, compare the genomes of closely related species within a genus or multiple genera within a family. What is apparent is the exception of existing genes for new functions, rather than the wholesale development of totally new genes. Here's just one example. Multiple species of garter snakes within the genus Thamnophis have evolved resistance to newt tetrodotoxin by developing several point mutations in a muscle sodium channel protein. Looking even more broadly to animals as a whole, many genes possessed by animals are also possessed by fungi, ichthyosporians, philisterians, and coanoflagellates. We even share a triple gene fusion for three genes involved in pyrimidine biosynthesis with amoebozoans. Animals share with the unicellular coanoflagellates a variety of genes that animals have fashioned for multicellularity, such as cadherins, C-type lectins, tyrosine kinases, 
and more recently discovered a hedgehog homolog. And recent phylogenetic analyses have shown that animals underwent major gene duplication events early in their evolutionary history, followed by large amounts of gene loss. Gene gain and loss occur differentially across the animal tree rather than new genes being invented suddenly. This again favors an evolutionary scenario rather than some kind of design. One final point before wrapping up, the concept of genetic information as Meyer applies it is so vague that it's unusable. There are no metrics for determining how much information any given sequence of DNA has. Does the longer gene have more information than a shorter one, even if the shorter one is involved in more processes? How much information does a promoter region have, or a repressor region, or an enhancer region? We can't quantify how much genetic information is needed to go from a fin to an arm, but we can calculate how many mutations have evidently occurred. It is for this reason that biologists talk about specific genes and genetic regions instead of vaguely gesturing at information. The word is intentionally used in this manner to muddy the conversation. So that concludes a thorough assessment of Meyer's two biggest talking points, the fossil record and genetics. To summarize, we can see that when it comes to these topics, Meyer has only one strategy. He puts forward some premise that is really just a lie about science, and from that he draws the conclusion, God did it. There are two huge problems with this. First, again, the premise is always false. He's just lying. He's lying about the duration and nature of the Cambrian explosion. He's lying about the lack of transitional fossils. He's lying about basic freshman year undergraduate level genetics concepts. The premise is always false. Furthermore, the logic he uses to get to his conclusion is also invalid. Even if his premise were correct and he was actually citing some unexplained phenomenon, to conclude God did it is not scientific ever. End of story. We don't know things and we seek to figure them out. That is done through scientific research, not pontification that is motivated by a specific desired theological conclusion. As an alleged philosopher of science, it is astounding that Meyer does not grasp this. It is also astounding how many ways these DI folks can dress up the god of the gaps in different costumes to fill not just temporary gaps in human knowledge, but gaps in their own personal knowledge, which could quickly be rectified by learning about existing science. But in the end, that is truly the only god they have, the pathetic, impotent god that Meyer so desperately fights and lies for, the one who can't seem to figure out exactly what it is he wants to create and when, having to step in every few million years to make some new stuff from scratch because he isn't powerful enough to manufacture a mechanism by which the diversification happens on its own. This is what makes Meyer yet another apologist hack, just like the rest of them. To a layperson, does he sound like he knows what he's talking about? Yes. Does he sound like a reasonable, grounded person? Yes. Does he sound sincere in his convictions? Yes. Is he actually any of those things? Not even a little bit. It's a facade, a costume he wears for those who only need a friendly tone and a message they want to hear, but have no desire to actually learn a thing about science. He is fully aware of all the research he contradicts in his content, his career is centered around it. One could therefore say that Meyer is slightly more sophisticated than some apologists in that while some of his lies are blatantly obvious to anyone who got a B or better in ninth grade biology, some of them do require an investigation of the primary scientific literature, an investigation he knows that not a single member of his target audience will produce. But that's why I bring the investigation to you, so that we can all conclude together, religious or otherwise, that like everyone else affiliated with the DI, Meyer is a complete fraud. And we can now safely cue the desperate response from Meyer and pals, 
whining in their safe little blogs, shielded from outside commentary, about what an unqualified, uncredentialed loser I am, with no acknowledgement of being completely unable to address anything I say with even a shred of honesty. It must be embarrassing to get so thoroughly exposed and humiliated by someone with such a poor pedigree, isn't it, fellas? So that's it. I hope you enjoyed part two of this series exposing the lies and agenda of the Discovery Institute. But don't worry, we have many more frauds to expose. I'll see you next time.